Welcome to the next in our series of Choose Growth, where we're going to talk about growing your team. I'm here with Naomi Simpson to talk about this really important topic. Hi, Naomi. Hi, BJ. Let's talk about growing a team for a small and growing business. Mm. So clearly you can't do everything yourself. I'd would like you? to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly wouldn't. <laughs> so um, what was your first hire when you were scaling your business? Oh, my first hire was, well, my first hire was actually the next door neighbour. Is that right? Yeah, because um, I'd outsourced the development of the website and it was built in a particular platform that nobody's even heard of anymore. And then I realised that it was going to cost more and more money every time I wanted to make a change. And uh, coincidentally, I found out that my neighbour um, programmed in this language. And so uh, I didn't have any money. And I said to him, I said, oh, I don't have any money, but if you just want to come and practice while you're looking for a job. And as it happened, he ended up being the first team member. Right, and, and how did you decide that you reached a point where you needed more people? It, uh, the phone began to ring, uh, and this was way back in the early days, and I, I was still running my consulting business, so I was a freelance marketer after I left my corporate career, and I realised that if I didn't give this baby some time and energy, it wasn't going to fly, and you know, got to look after the customer, got to listen deeply to the customer and that was taking time. So um, I gave up my, um, my very uh, interesting and challenging uh, role as a marketing consultant and, and I was just all in. And uh, so that, I was the first uh, team member. And then after that it, was, it really became, I can't do everything. What is it that I am not good at? And then let's find those resources. I, and I started, I remember also I started, um, you know, with interns who were looking for marketing jobs and so forth. And um, I realised that I needed far more than that because I needed people who were, had a commitment to the enterprise longer term and the quality of the work that we were doing. So, um, but I think the funniest thing that I ever did was probably about a year in, I put a job ad that cost $30 in what was called monster.com back then, which is like a seek of today. And I put this job ad and I couldn't choose between the two candidates. They were vastly, vastly different. And I couldn't choose. Um, and so, and it was for a product management role. And um, I ended up employing them both. And uh, it was the best thing I ever did because finally I had capacity. I wasn't just chasing my tail. And they ended up being very, very different people. Um, one is now our COO and has been with us for 18 years. The other one stayed for three years and was far more on the PR kind of side. Uh, but she's still a, a very good friend and was a supplier to us for years and years. She went off and started her own business. So I think that's the best thirty dollars I ever spent. Oh, Let's it's just a get it. But I guess the point is, we often are saying, "What can I afford?" versus "What's going to give me capacity to grow?" And if I had have chosen one, who knows? And actually, then they were a part of team, and that's important too because. You need more than one idea. It's not my way or the highway. There has to be other ideas and people listening in different ways. So yeah, it gave capacity, bandwidth and team. Yeah, well I've learned a lot from you. We share a passion for people and, and growing them and building the team around great people. Uh, tell me about your four P's that you talked about in your podcast, with it live what you love. Oh, my four P's. You can tell I'm a regional marketer, you know, with my four P's. <laughs> The first thing is about passion, and passion is about energy. It's about how you feel things, and you can't fake it till you make it. But when people are trying to understand where they want to give their energy is to observe. When they're in flow, when they don't even know the time of the day, and often that will be their passion. The second thing is about your language, the words you use, so positivity. You know, is the glass half full or is it half empty? I'm innately positive. Like I always see an opportunity. It's grey, it's raining. Well, it's good for the garden. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. I always see the positive. But the words you use define your reality. If you say you can, you could. If you say you can't, you won't. It's kind of the language you use is really, really important. And taking time to breathe through that. So in a stressful situation, if, if you feel a bit confronted, which happens a lot for business owners, just breathe, just take your time. You, nobody said you have to respond like that. It's okay, breathe. So the power of positive words, because you can't unsay things either. Mm -hmm. And if you're just reacting, 
you're not necessarily being the leader you need to be. Um, the third one is about persistence. It takes time and you do have to keep picking yourself up. It's about, you know, no business is an overnight success and, um, and it's okay. Uh, but persistence is different than peak headedness, which is peak headedness is putting, it's my way or the highway, you stick head in the ground and I said it was gonna be like that. Persistence is listening and responding, listening and responding. And for me, it was listening to customers and responding, listening. And then finally, it is about purpose. And people often misunderstand purpose with passion. Passion is yours, it's your energy. Purpose is always about how you're making the world a better place. It's always about contribution. It's always about making the world slightly better for other human beings. And when you get that purpose, um, it's important to share it and in a, a very succinct story about why. Uh, so yeah, that's my four P's, and, and which I live by, and they've served me in business, uh, and they've served me in life, quite frankly. Yes, look, and we, we've spoken to a few of your team here at BIG, and they absolutely love being here. Mm. Look, and, and it's inspirational for all the small businesses to have a team of people who, who absolutely buy into the business. The challenge is, though, as a small business owner, you've created your business in a particular way, and someone comes in and says, you know what, do it this way. Mm. How, how do you mentally coach people to, to adjust to that? Oh, one of the great books I read was The Multiplier by Liz Wyman. Oh. Um, and it talks about how you ask challenging questions because none of us want to be told what to do. And they don't, being prescriptive, of course we have a framework by which we operate. We have a plan, we have strategy, we have pillars, we have tactics, and ultimately we have performance areas. But really, telling somebody well, you tick it this way and you do it that way is really uninspiring for anybody. So how do you challenge people for greatness using questions? And you know, it's kind of a fun exercise for any people manager, is go into your one-on-one -on -one or your meeting and only ask questions. Leaders must stay curious, they must stay interested and interesting, but a leader should be listening far more than they're actually speaking. And one way to do that is, is through asking amazing questions. So what's an example of a great question? So tell me, Vijay, you've been working on this project. Is it your best work? Oh, that's a tough one. It's a really tough one. Because yeah. there's only two answers. There's yes or no. And if it's no, I need to say to you as a manager, what was missing that you weren't able to do your best work? Because in there, I will understand whether it's a time constraint, a systems constraint, a resources constraint. So just being able to ask somebody quite frankly, oh, I don't know, I didn't have time. Okay, why didn't you have time? Was the brief not clear? Let's understand this, because otherwise you end up in this perpetual notion of everything always being the same. And actually, our job as leader is to shift it. You know, they say the definition of uh, stupidity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different outcome. So being able to ask robust questions without judgment. Is it your best work? How could I have supported you better? What was missing that if you had it, it would be your best work? And that comes without judgment. But also the person knows next time, they're not gonna rock up with something half finished and they're gonna think, wow, I can't get this done because I'm waiting on X, Y, and Z. Okay, well, let's talk that through. So I think too often, particularly here, we play nice and we don't ask enough tough questions. And in my experience, people want to do a great job and they want to be challenged to greatness. So then what, what are the inhibitors to that? Often we just be nice and we go, oh, that's nice. Yeah. It may be, and maybe it's not. And this is not to say that their way is not a right way. There's many ways to solve a problem, many ways to work. But that's why, like even in an interviewing process, and when I think about diversity and inclusion, our recruitment processes, the way that historically businesses do them, are quite divisive. Because if it doesn't, the first one doesn't, you know, first response doesn't really appeal, or, oh, I don't know if they'll fit in. But what about if they're neuro neurologically diverse? That means they're on the spectrum somewhere. It doesn't mean they couldn't contribute to their enterprise, but how do they want to be interviewed? So we even right at the beginning of a recruitment cycle is to be able to say, now how would this process work best for you? How will you show us 
how you're going to fit into our organisation and do your best work. Well, that's a very, very different proposition to somebody who might be on the spectrum versus somebody who is outgoing and flamboyant or somebody who's an introvert. In, you know, we often are looking for somebody like us in a recruitment process and there's plenty of studies on that. So really, um, asking really great questions early on in recruitment is going to help you get to diversity at every level. You know, this notion of where people work has been completely flipped and that offers incredible opportunity for people with disability who might not have to go to an office anymore, might not have to travel, and public transport and travel can be very hard, but they're absolutely capable of doing amazing things. And, you know, I sit on the board of the Cerebral Palsy Alliance and we understand the challenges of people's mobility, but we also know that they're less than 5% more likely to have more sick days than anybody else. And giving people incredible responsibility, wonderfully fulfilling jobs, is what diversity is about right. and inclusion at every level. So you can hear my passion and it all comes from our ability to ask questions at the right way and doing process. You know, often we're trying to fit somebody into a box, what looks like me, and we've seen it over and over again. Right, okay, well that, that really helps a startup or a small business with their first few hires and that's really great advice. What about the businesses that are a little bit larger and are scaling uh, and now suddenly need to add in some layers, for example, or different offices and so on? What are some of the challenges you see with a, with a scaling business? Well, what's challenge often for a founder is when they cannot do it anymore, they can't control everything. And in fact, sometimes I see founders limiting the size of the growth of their business because they begin to be the bottleneck. Everything has to go via the founder, everything has to go via the CEO, everything has to be approved, and that actually slows the whole process down. So it's it, to create trust inside an enterprise comes from the investment you make in frameworks. Is that person there, know what they're there to do? Does anybody notice, do they go home feeling like a winner? Three fundamentals in terms of recognising people. But for, so for an, uh, for an owner, for a founder, if you want to scale your business, you're going to have to have trust. What is going to make you comfortable? And it's not necessarily just the um, financial outcome. It's not necessarily, oh, we made a whole bunch of sales. Are, we, are they working on the strategic as well as the tactical levers for, for the long, distance as well as the short distance. So um, building trust is really, really important within teams and having a shared experience, shared sense of purpose, shared values, and you do that every single day. You've got to keep creating it, creating it, and creating it. Okay, and uh, just extending on that topic, obviously the geographic boundaries have opened up, ironically, with COVID, because it's now easier to sell overseas. It's now easier to hire people cross borders and have them work remotely. Mm. How, how do you manage that? Oh, well, we've got people everywhere and a bit of a surprise, you know, because some of our people also moved um, during COVID and chose to take sea changes and tree changes and all the rest. And then when, it, when we came back into a workspace, they were like, oh, not coming every day because and that's what's great is that people can have fulfilling careers everywhere but it takes real intention and management uh, to make sure that everybody feels a part of the team and isn't um, separated so you know in this office here you'll see we've got screens everywhere that's one click and you're connected and it's really really easy and video and audio so that if somebody is in Tasmania and we do have people around the country in New Zealand actually <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but our head of ops is in France. Has been for more than a year. So, um, you know, we've got, uh, we've got people everywhere and it's the systems that actually allows us to, for people to feel connected. And, um, but you've got to be really intention, intentional with your, pro, with your program of work of keeping people connected. So people can be everywhere. You can recruit from anywhere. But again, you want to recruit based on not somebody who looks just like me. You want to recruit based on, well, what do I need in my organisation? organization right now. I think there'll be far more free flowing um, appointments, you know, people will come together for projects, they might not work for that enterprise for the whole time. Big piece of work, big piece of transformation and then they'll go and do that elsewhere. So I guess also this notion of job for life is well and truly gone. Yeah. Unless you're the founder and you're still there. <laughs> <laughs> I do like your, your point about, you know, recruiting people who look like me. Mm. Um, and you know, diversity is 
obviously in the media all over the place now, whether it's age or gender, cultural, um, any of those kind of things. How, how, do you, how do you advise your businesses on balancing that? Yeah, one of the things is um, where your intention goes is, is what will happen. Um, one of the things that we continue to do is a diversity and inclusion report, even though like, we've got everybody and everything and it's never been a problem. But we also had to hand on heart say, well, are we getting this right? And I can really proudly show the outcome of, of having a different way or a different view. And I think that's, that's really, really important. But any enterprise, doesn't matter what size it is, should be checking on things like equal pay across all of the diverse groups of people, it's not just gender, um, must be checking, um, also must be checking how they're recruiting. And if you're not getting enough candidates of variety and you're only getting one cohort, why? And then start thinking about your pipeline. How are you building your pipeline earlier than just at the point of I need to recruit now? So you're thinking about, well, is there enough graduates coming out of university? Where do these people hang out? Are they in another industry? We've got incredible people out of the travel industry for our business. So, um, so um, I always say you can teach for skills, but you can't teach for values. So that's the most important thing. Do we have somebody who's got a deep work ethic, wants to do great work, believes in what we're doing? And that's who we're seeking. Yeah, it's a pretty similar belief to mine. Higher character, teach skill. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. exactly. When you have small businesses or growing businesses, quite often the owners haven't gotten the experience of managing people before. What's your tip for that employee engagement when you need to get bad news, for example, or some kind of performance discussions? Oh, just a small question then, Vijay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, tough questions. Often, especially in Australia, we play nice, like we say the nice thing. Don't confuse the person who's about to get some news. You know, you really, you know, you're really nice and we really like you, but sorry, we've got to let you go. Does the person's just left confused. So a performance conversation sh shouldn't be happening for the first time. They should have some understanding. So I always find that regular small conversations build up a whole kind of body of understanding and, and relationship with that person. So are you having regular one-on-ones? Do they know what they're there to do? Is it written down? Do they know what success looks like? What is that metric for success? Does anybody know where they fit into the overall organisation? So you, the onus is on you, just saying, oh, they just didn't seem right. It's not the answer. I mean, I know people who've recruited 27 sales managers and they still can't find the right one. Man, nah, let's just think about that. What's the one thing here that's the same? It's you. So, um, so really investing the time to make sure that you've done that. And then if, if somebody is not aligned, and you need to also manage people based on their values. If you see them not living your values, that's the number one thing that's a not negotiable as far as I'm concerned, and having that conversation. And that's what I coach the, um, my startup. You know, if you've only got one employee, they better be good, you know. And if they right. say that, I don't know the number, but you know, 60% of people are disengaged, well, it better not be my person because I've only got. So investing the time and also having the conversations as soon as you see them. You know, thanks for that. That work. Thank you for that work. Um, didn't meet the brief. Let's go back and have a look at the brief. And never about the personality. You know, they just didn't fit in. That is not an answer. It, it's about their work. It's about their productivity. It's about their contribution. But if they're not living their values, it's not that they don't fit in. It's the fact that they haven't lived the values. Um, and you know, we don't like gossips and we don't like bullies. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's against the law. Uh, so, you know, if you see those behaviours, you cannot walk past it. You've got to say it in the moment. And it sounds like it's about building the right culture, all of these elements over time. And I get two kinds of businesses I speak to. The small ones say, we're too young or too small to have a culture this year. Or those to say, the culture's already set. It's been that way now, we're just going to go with it. When's the right time to reset your culture? Day one. Culture comes from leadership. Culture yep. comes from the stories that people tell. Culture comes from the experience of work and how people connect to their higher purpose. No, culture happens from day one. You know, people used to walk into our office and go, oh, I just feel the vibe, you know, I just feel it. And that's very different now because, you know, two thirds of our team won't be in here on any given day. So you don't feel it in the same sort of way. And that's why it takes real intention to stay connected with your team. Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much, Naomi. So my pleasure, BJ. We've had fun.